good afternoon, everyone. And Professor uh, Savik, uh, really pleasure to see you again. Uh, so is uh, Professor uh, Balakrishnan, and great start by uh, Professor uh, Ranjan Saxena. I wear m multiple hats. So uh, what I'm, uh, the disclaimer is what I'm saying is my personal view. Uh, I do not represent. <laughs> These views are not to be represented of, of, of the organization uh, I am connected with. So, of course, I'm the founding CEO of BITS Biocity Foundation, uh, amazingly supported by DST. Oh, let me start my timer. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I also sit on the board of Venture Center at Pune, which is India's largest uh, science and technology uh, incubator. Uh, and I work with uh, you know, a couple of startups as well. And of course, I was a former head of strategy at BIRAC. And the program that BIRAC started um, you know, during my time probably has funded close to three, 4,000 startups in the biotech medtech space. Now, uh, you know, great points by my uh, by previous panelists. There is an effervescence of startups in India, and not just the SaaS-based IT startups. You know, deep, deep science technology startups are happening in India. Uh, all across India, uh, definitely in the big institutes, um, in, including Bits Pilani across his five campuses. You know, we have all these unicorns coming out. Uh, that is uh, an interesting phenomenon which has happened in the last 15, 20 years. So let me ask you a question here. I mean, I see a lot of young faces. Uh, you know, uh, do you think you're going to go, if you're, if you're still students, I'm guessing you're students, uh, do you think you'll go and work in a startup? Uh, once you graduate, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, is the answer going to be yes, or are you going to go and work in big multinational companies and, and and other places? And so that's again an indicator where the startup stands, right? Um, so let me divide my five minutes. The first uh, one minute I've already taken. The next four minutes in two phases. What is happening in the startup world? Uh, and what, how it is connected to our academia, right? So India, I don't know, second, third biggest startup nation in the world, 90,000 startups. Uh, perhaps, you know, 15, 20,000 startups would be in deep science, as I said, not just IT. Um, so, and we're talking about change, transforming our centers of learning into centers of not just knowledge creation, new knowledge creation, but taking all the way to commercialization and uh, uh, what we call as translation, right? I had one such center, and we have like 30, 40 PhD students working, and I see what are the gaps right now. I have also seen a lot of startups come out of Indian academia. Now, if you want to take, uh, you know, this is the second FICI industry academia. Imagine, the 20th convening of the same thing in next after 18 years. Would you be talking the same thing? I hope not, right? So, so if you want to transform Indian academia into centers of knowledge creation, not just center knowledge creation, but as well taking mark, you know, products to the market, a uh, lot of that would depend on what we modulate inside our academia what we modulate outside of it. Uh, let me focus on the first inside bit of it, right? So you think you'll have startup come out, spin outs come out of Indian academia. What I see there is that one, a lot of these startups started by faculty, uh, may not have, or by students, may not have had the experience of a product life cycle. Taking the journey, or, you know, seeing the journey, understanding the journey of a product from ideation all the way to market, including regulatory, every other thing that you can think of, investment. Somebody said, right? So there, I think our Indian academia has to reach out to industry, not just as, you know, maybe professor of practice and all of that. Can we imagine entrepreneur in residence for Indian academia? And I don't know whether each department can have one or not, but at least one or two in each university, right? Not just for the incubator that are being created, but for the university itself, right? So they look at technology, they look at uh, things that are coming out from the laboratory and understand. Second, no matter what you do, not everything has to go through startups, right? 
some of those, I mean, why do you want to push everyone to be a uh, you know, startup? Um, you know, sometimes uh, people don't want to be, and that's okay. In that case, your technology transfer offices become very, very important. Now, are our TTOs, you know, technology transfer offices flexible? Do the TTOs understand, you know, what it takes, how to evaluate technology that are coming out from your labs? Connect with the industry. You know, people are speaking about the language of the industry. Very important. I don't see that, right? So our TTOs have to be very flexible. Uh, man, sorry to use that word, manned. I don't know. Uh, people by, people by, you know, resources who understand technology uh, at its depth uh, and the marketing of it as well. Um, so third is. We're talking about, you know, so imagine a lot of startups are coming out of our big institutes and even uh, mid-tier uh, institutes as well. Can we, when we start, when our placement officers start thinking about, not placement officers, but when we think about, you know, second, third year, you know, fourth semester students thinking of internship, I know startups, deep tech startups, sorry to use that word, the science and technology startups that have, you know, raised money, uh, you know, looking for interns, and they don't get interns, right? Because most interns, most third-year students, second-year students who go and do an internship, you know, maybe in a fintech company in Bombay or consulting firm or whatever those things are. You know, our startups are not getting uh, really uh, high brain-powered undergrads to do internship with them, right? So that's, that's the second gap I see. Uh, third is, you know, how do you create I, this was the first problem was, you know, most of these startups coming out of academia do not understand product lifecycle journeys. So how do you create those platforms? I've found in the last 15 years of my time in, in, in the innovation space in India, starting with Bairag and other places, is that it has to start simple steps. You know, you will have to bring them together, sometimes force them together, and create communities, uh, small communities, and let them talk. Second is your internal academic uh, processes. You know, now a lot of, you know, start a lot of academia are having an IP uh, policy, uh, faculty trying to become uh, a, a startup co-founder policy. So those, those are happening. On paper, yes, but I know cases where you know, if you are in an autonomous institute funded by the government, and if I want to, or, uh, you know, if I want to become a, uh, you know, faculty startup co-founder, sometimes, you know, if one uh, funding agency in India has 30 or 20 autonomous institutes spread across India, sometimes there is no harmonization of policies across those. So how do you do, you know, so something on paper, is great, but putting it to practice, and if, if a faculty has to wait like you know one year to you know get the permission to start uh, a startup, then that one year of technology is gone, right? So those processes are very important uh, to, to 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 really think of. Finally, let me end by uh, okay, I've got a minute. Uh, finally, let me end by uh, you know giving a couple of examples that I have seen, uh, and I will go to take some names, please Google them. Uh, they're amazing startups. There are many, many startups from, the, from my Bayrak experience, I'm saying. Uh, look at what Doji, D-O-Z-E-E, -D -E has done, right? Look at what Pandorum, uh, you know, I've been an advisor there, so there's a biasness there, uh, has done in terms of at least trying to build uh, a deep tech startup. They may, f I hope they don't, don't, don't fail, but if they don't make it, that's also okay. Because I think, Finally, in 10, 15 years' time, we do not want to have a nation where we do not have people who haven't gone through the journey of either success or failure, right? And uh, I'm amazed by Scandinavian countries. There are, you know, amazing, uh, uh, you know, innovation culture. I think rather than being completely enamored by uh, the big daddy of innovation, which is the U.S., Let's go and study some of these places, right? Whether it's Finland or Sweden or even Norway or, uh, you know, all those places uh, do amazing science and innovation. So let's, let's just reach out to them and see. I will stop there.
No, I saw you looking at me. I thought my time was up. <laughs> no, 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 no. If, uh, if you have something important to share, please go ahead. I'll yeah, you... I, just 30 yeah. seconds more, maybe a minute. Uh, I haven't heard the bell. So, <laughs> so uh, look at, you know, what, I'll give one or two, again, examples, um, you know, to, to see the super truck experiment that maybe you know, right? So look at the super truck experiment. So where U.S. government actually asked you know, the big truck companies, the Dunmer Benz and others, can, can they improve the efficiency of it? And, and it's the Department of Energy, uh, pro, you know, uh, was the program. And this whole program was initiated and launched through industry, right? The industry then had to choose which academic partner they're going to partner with. Now the game changes here because most of what we do here is that the funding bodies give money to academia and then they say go and look for industry, right? Now, and that is a different kind of trust and everything. We can spend hours talking about that. So that is one. What would it take our funding agency, our country as a, you know, as, as a, you know, the culture, the, the trust to build for our industry? I think Professor Sovik mentioned and what percent of R&D and all of that. But a lot of new uh, SMEs are, and our startups are focusing on real R&D, right? So let's just encourage them and give them the support. Uh, second, my last one. Uh, is during my Bayrak time, uh, we had brought somebody called uh, uh, Eagle Elric. He is the founder of a program in Israel called Yozma, uh, Y-O-Z-M-A. Look at it. And Yozma possibly transformed Israel to what we call a startup nation, right? And when we met him in 2015 or 2016, he came and I asked him, you know, uh, what are your thoughts on Israel as a startup nation? He said, hey, I don't want Israel to be, to remain a startup nation. And it was a bit of a counterintuitive. They said, why? Because I want Israel to be a uh, SME nation, right? Uh, like Germany, yeah, like, like, like Mr. Sons there. And that was a great a moment. I think rather than chasing only unicorns, can we have deep science and technology uh, where they can do $100 million of revenues, but they, they are good. And, and look at Moderna or Biontech. Nobody knew about them at the heart of any of us knew, uh, knew about them three years back. It's not that the mRNA vaccine come out of the blue. They've been working with partnership with, with the university and government funding for the last 10, 15 years, 20 years. So my proposition to uh, this amazing industry body in a great history if you turn back, you can see Mahatma Gandhi's quotation there, uh, right there, is to think how, how do we build that trust for industry to lead uh, public-private partnership programs, not just being led by the academia. So, Professor Sovik, uh, thank you for your wonderful, sublime leadership at BITS over the last six years, and we learned a lot from you. Thank you.